welcome everybody to the um, nth annual Global Governance and Human Security PhD alumni panel, um, in which we answer the question, what do our alumni do when they get out of here? Uh, we have three panelists today in order of graduation. We have Natalia Escobar Pimberti, Jeremiah Asaka, and Jean Pierre Murray. Um, and rather than have me introduce them further and quite possibly screw it up, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. So if you could give um, brief introductions of who you are, what you do, and where you are, um, in that order, Natalia. Thank you, Professor Barkin, and thank you very much for the invitation. It's very good to be back, and we certainly miss your Thursday afternoon jokes, especially in these dark days when it was already dark when we started our uh, theory of international relations class. So it's, it's good to be back a little bit in time, even though it seems that it has been about 10 years already or something like that. But I know, crazy. So, but uh, happy to see everyone and, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, my name is Natalia escobar Pemberti, and I'm originally from Colombia. I'm part of the first cohort of the PhD in Global Governance and Human Security. I started exactly 10 years ago and I graduated in uh, 2017, 2018. Uh, in that process, uh, my work is on the implementation of international environmental agreements, and uh, I joined UMass Boston having worked for a university for a couple of years, so I had a little bit of academic background, but certainly uh, the PhD uh, brought a lot of changes on that, and I, I imagine that, I will, that we will end up talking about that at some point. Uh, I went back to Colombia in 2017, back and forth for, for a little bit more than a year. And I continue working for the university where I did my undergrad. That was also uh, the one that I was working for. I taught there different undergrad courses in international relations, uh, regional studies, and I also teach a seminar on research methods for international business uh, in a master's in international business degree. Uh, I moved back to the United States for family reasons in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, and I taught remotely for two years and also started teaching here as an adjunct at Boston University. And since this summer, I'm um, a full-time lecturer there. Uh, I, I'm, no, I'm no longer teaching uh, in Colombia, I'm, I'm working at BU as a full-time lecturer, and I teach their courses on uh, regional studies in Latin America, environment and development in Latin America, and also other classes on sustainable development and natural resources that are more connected, of course, uh, to what I did in the PhD. So happy to see everyone and, and to catch up a little bit and, and to discuss the adventures of academia after the PhD. So thanks. Thank you. Um, Jeremiah? Yes, I was muted, but <clears throat> I'm good. Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon, good night. Um, I'm Jeremiah Ogonda Asaka. And I believe I was in the third cohort, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, so um, I left UMB in 2018. And uh, currently, I'll talk more about uh, the other stuff as I see uh, the questions that uh, Prof. Sami had for us. So um, currently, I'm um, an assistant professor of security studies at uh, Sam Houston State University. The university is in Huntsville. So Huntsville is a little, um, a little city. It's basically a college town uh, north of Houston. But I live between Houston and Huntsville in a place called the Woodlands, which is where I'm uh, zooming in from now. And um, currently I have primary research interest in um, human slash environmental security. And I can talk more about uh, more specific projects uh, if there are questions or if questions come up. Um, I think that'll be it for me at this point. And yeah, 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, JP. Sure. Hi, everyone, and uh, thanks for the invitation to come back to share. It's interesting to come back as an alum. Um, I really had gotten adjusted and quite comfortable with being a student, and I'm now discovering that there are um, some positives to not being a student, but also some things like conference registration, which change significantly subsequent to graduating. Um, but so I, I don't know what number cohort I'm in. I started in 2016, I think. Yes, I started in 2016 um, and I graduated uh, this year. Um, I had a similar trajectory to Natalia. Um, I taught um, in Jamaica before starting the PhD program and similarly went back um, to um, my undergraduate university to teach um, for a couple of years um, after completing my field work. Um, so I was doing that right up to graduation, a couple of those years remote because of COVID. And uh, since then, since graduating, I've been at Wellesley College as a visiting, visiting lecturer. Um, my research is in migration and security, um, international organizations. I teach international organizations, global governance, um, things international, really. Um, yeah, so looking forward to the, to the discussion. Happy to share more as we go along. Uh, ironically enough, um, the visiting position that JP is in at this moment is open because of the retirement of a guy named Craig Murphy, who was uh, one of the people to set up the Global Governance and Human Security program in the first place. It's a small world out there. Um, so I'd like to start us off by um, asking our three panelists, um, what do you know now that you wish you'd known as a second year doctoral student? Um, start off again with Natalia. That's a very interesting question and it brings a lot of lessons from the past two years, let's say that are, are, maybe we should start by answering and say, that, say that we wish we knew that pandemics were going to happen, right? But in terms of, of the academic life and in all that process, I think that that the PhD really opened, uh, at least in my personal experience, the approach that I had to both having coming from a couple of years or so of experience teaching, I I wish that I knew as a second year doctoral student, how much my teaching was going to change to some extent. You think that you're doing your job, you sort of get a hold of that. Of course, it's different coming from, from, from Colombia and getting that perspective and a different process of joining academia. But I think that it definitely changed. I wish I knew how much my teaching was going to change both a in terms of methodology, but also in terms of the substance and, and the specific interest that that I was going to have and the possibilities of, of including many of, of the lessons that we get, especially uh, conducting research and establishing these links and these networks into the day-to-day -day reality of teaching undergrads, especially, of course. But also uh, uh, getting to involve many of the processes that you're doing in the teaching on your specific research, right? And, and on the connection to your now more specialized areas of interest and the fields in, in which you're working. Uh, for me, moving from teaching regional studies and international relations, that was what I thought before uh, moving to Boston to teaching environmental politics in Latin America and international organizations and global affairs definitely gave me a, a different perspective a, and a different approach to that process. All of that, of course, has changed uh, with the way our teaching has changed to some extent. And I think that regardless of being back to normal and and 
and or not or teaching remotely or not i think that that we're at a, we're at a point in which uh, as a doctoral student knowing that i was going to go into academia i will i will recommend probably for us it was very difficult to know but i will recommend those that are interested in academia to work a lot or to to develop additional skills on things that that have been brought to us by the pandemic that that are also useful tools in terms of our day-to-day -day teaching and and we can make a long list of tools and and instruments and and probably that raises another question is that i wish that i knew how much my students were going to change right and and how spending four years or five years at umass was going to put me in front of a completely different generation of students that has other other needs and other realities and other approaches to the learning process that that is certainly a more challenging and 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 that adds to to that new reality so i i and i also wish that i knew a little bit more about like applying to jobs and and all those all all those uh, processes that that are also uh, interesting and that of course when when you start in the process of graduating and you go into that you you develop those skills and we have had the support of of all of you on those fronts at different points but i also think that that it it will have been good to to be to have more of those details and to have always that process in mind uh, as you move on in terms of of developing your portfolio and figuring out which classes would you like to teach and formalizing like things as like how you want to approach your teaching philosophy and your service and all those uh, that for me coming from a couple of years of experience of teaching look very like a standard but then i was like i didn't know that i that all these things counted like service or i didn't know that i had to uh, make sure that i formalize these processes or that i keep records of this and this because all those things are going to be useful as you move on in applying to your job so i will highlight those three things and, and leave a little bit more for jp and, and jeremiah but uh, hopefully that will that will help thank you uh jeremiah yes uh <clears throat> thank you so much natalia uh, i think she's covered a lot of ground um and um i have one thing that i wish i knew at year two um the significance of adaptability so your ability to adapt to different situations and i'll give an example with teaching especially so for my i've not taught much i taught at uh middle tennessee state and then where i am currently and and then a bit one class at, at umb um which is a, a ta and from my experience at year two i thought i would teach the courses i was um taking or something close to the courses i was taking in grad school but then when you get to your program there are these courses called intros and if you're in a department that has very little to do with what you study, sometimes you find yourself teaching things that you have no clue about. <laughs> so you're always just like one chapter ahead of the students. <laughs> so you have to be very willing to be adaptable. If not, then you might actually really struggle. Yeah, so that's something that I wish I knew in year two. Um, the rest, I feel like Natalia has really done a good job with it. But this one, I really want you guys to at least pick, be adaptable. And especially if you're uh, interdisciplinary. So there are people like myself, <clears throat> my degrees are all over the place. And so if you get into a department like a, a policy department, and which is very disciplined, let's say they don't have IR, you can find it a bit rough. Even getting in might be a problem too. <clears throat> yeah, so adaptability is something i think i'll flag that you should think about okay i'll leave my time to jp <laughs> uh jeremiah did, have you considered the possibility that your own faculty had no idea what they were talking about and were simply one 
class ahead of you. Uh, JP, I remember. Sorry, I remember one thing. One time in uh, Prof. Sami's class, there's a. So, uh, how many were we? Were we 15? I think the IR intro, I think we were 15. And at some point, I thought everyone had taken an IR class. I was the only one that had never taken an IR class. So, I told Sami about it. It was like, don't worry about this. It's uh, we actually starting like from scratch. So, <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, um, I, I think. I think maybe to start on that point, um, maybe from year one, you should know that the people around you that seem like they know what they're talking about and that they seem to have it all together often don't on both accounts, right? Um, they just happen to have skimmed as much as you did just before class and are braver to take that leap, right? When So when you feel afraid to talk up in class, they're just braver to take that leap, but they are just as uh, hmm, confused, if it, if it is that you're confused. I mean, so in my cohort, I was probably the only one who had done IR before and, and had the misfortune of also teaching IR before. And I made that known in class. And then you can imagine when Peggy was, well, you don't, you don't have Peggy now, but I, when I would go to Peggy's class for IO, I would have to be on top of my game. I had to do every single reading just because, oh my God, I cannot disappoint, right? And, and sometimes I still had no clue what I was talking about, but, you know, I, and I thought others knew what they were talking about and yet I was the one who studied it. So you get the point. Um, but what I would really want to flag, um, two quick things is one that irrespective of the fact that we talk about the PhD journey as being one that is, isolated and isolating, you definitely need community. Um, I found community in my cohort, um, and that was really helpful in getting me through. Uh, there were points at which, um, especially during COVID, when we were at different parts of the world, right? Um, and yet staying connected while being in different parts of the world really helped organizing writing groups together or having people that you can bounce ideas off right somebody you can share a diagram with when you're trying to figure out how to map your theoretical framework and you may share it with them they're like mm, maybe try it this way right that was really 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 helpful um and that community doesn't also doesn't have to be those people in your immediate cohort right you can connect with I mean, we have um, so many alum now and we have um, multiple cohorts. You can reach out to folks across that. Um, but I think it's very important. So you may be working on something that seems completely unrelated to anything that anyone else is working on. But that's the beauty about academia, right? You don't necessarily need to understand the content to figure out that maybe something is off with the method. Um, so it, it's important to, to tap into that. Um, and perhaps to, as a bridge from that point, um, the other thing I would like to say is... Literally the embodiment. It would have been helpful in the second year to be absolutely clear on the point that everybody has a very different journey through the PhD program. Um, that will help when someone from your cohort very precocious actually is scheduling a defense at the end of year two right and then you start panicking oh my gosh i'm barely figuring out my research question um you could end up finishing your dissertation before that person um also that you know as you're going through and this is going to happen so people are going to defend their proposals people are going to go off to do their field work your field work may take longer than someone else's um and then people are going to start defending their actual dissertation folks are going to graduate meanwhile you're still figuring out your data it is okay you are going to finish just know that um everyone's journey is different. We are all ending up at the same finish line, but some people are doing sprints, some people are doing distance, but you'll get there. 
Um, so I think that those are the two things that I'd really want to flag for you. It's isolating, but you need community and everyone's race is different. So focus on your race, stay in your lane. Well said, everybody. Um, any questions or thoughts from the floor at this point? Feel free to either jump in or raise your hand in that special Zoom way. Um, in the absence of someone willing to jump in first, I'm going to ask another round of questions. Um, which is, um, oh, question from Sophia. What, uh, to jump here, but uh, we might uh, make this question open to everyone. Um, what kept you going during your PhD journey? What would you advise newer students who might be having a hard time? Start with JP and go back, go the other direction this time. Uh, all right. So I think it was a number of things, right? Um, it's not one thing. Um, community, again, um, I can't stress that enough. That was very important. Um, I think I'm motivated by the fact that I can celebrate with other people. So um, it was helpful to see people I was working with. Um, making progress that motivated me but it, that is a double-edged sword as I said earlier someone defends and you feel like you're getting nowhere with your work right you spend the entire day in bed if if if, if you have to I mean I I do recall there was one day when um I mean I think I was making really good progress I had sent off like several chapters in a row to my committee and I was just like on the ball and on a day that wasn't my writing day, I got up at 6 a.m., got to my office and decided to take on the part of it that I was dreading most, revising the, the methods section. I opened it. It hit me. And for the first time ever, I couldn't work that day. Like, I, I, I canceled my class. I told my students that I'm not feeling well. I could, I'm like, I, I was crippled. Um, I went home and right, spent the rest of the day in bed. Um, but what keeps you going after that is the fact that you can then check in with someone else. You, It helps to talk with people who are going through the process, right? When you tell your mom that, oh, the PhD is, is stressful. When I tell my dad that it's stressful, he tells me that you're just reading books. Um, I used to have 16 and 17 hour work days. So they don't understand. Um, so, there, so there's that. Um, I would say my committee, but faculty in general. And in fact, <laughs> this is probably, it doesn't just keep you going through the PhD program. It keeps you going for the other questions that will come later on, like, you know, in the transition to the job market. I think that one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life was to go to UMass Boston because the faculty support you long after you've left. So um, at the points when I felt like I couldn't follow through with this project, I was checking in with these folks and they would remind me that, you know, it's possible. If you need to take a break, take a break, but you'll finish it. Um, so I think that those, those were um, some of the core bits, like just the people who support you through it. Um, there's your own drive, but honestly, your own drive can be fickle because every other day you question why you, you decided to do this. So th that's what I would say. Uh, thanks. Jeremiah? Yes, so I think the most important point uh, that I've had from JP, which I would also re uh, reiterate, is this is your own journey. It's um, there's a problem with, uh, it's not really a big problem, but there's an issue I noticed when I was there. The cohort mentality makes you feel like you're on the same path and are supposed to go at the same pace. <laughs> but that's really not it. And it, it hits you, it hits you, uh, I don't know, probably year two, year three, when people, when there are no classes to be taken together, you start realizing, whoa, 
where are my colleagues? <laughs> I remember there's a time I was back on campus. Um, that was the spring of 2017. I was I was TAing. And I'll barely see my colleagues because everybody's gone, others in the field, others are done, others have gone back to wherever countries they came from. So I think I can't stress this enough. This is your own journey and um, go at your own pace. Uh, whatever happens to your colleagues, don't let it really get into you. And um, the other thing I can also say is give yourself some grace. It's, yeah, it's, nobody's perfect. <laughs> and even the ones you think are doing really well, they're struggling. Like now, JP is just telling you guys how he would go to bed and not work the whole day. But some people might be like, oh, this guy's a star. It happens to all of us. So <laughs> we're all human. Uh, sometimes you're down and, um, yeah. And uh, the community is also good. The only other thing I see with the community is it's good to be aware of uh, the fact that different people understand things different or take things differently. Uh, I don't know if you guys know about this idea of positive, negative energy or, or sort. So it's, sometimes when it creeps in, some community are not necessary or a section. You have to be with the right people, basically. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, so don't don't force a community on yourself. For example, you don't have to be, sorry to say this, but you don't have to be as a cohort together. You can be three of you or four or five within your cohort that are gelling together and that will take you far. Yeah, so um, I think, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that and um, you can prompt me more and <laughs> maybe some thoughts will come, yeah. <laughs> Natalia. I will definitely reinforce that. Uh, the feeling of community and the friendships that you do as a result of that cohort bonding are fundamental. And in my case, are one, they are right there at the top of the things that I got out of the PhD. The, I have a WhatsApp group that is called the PhD aunties, and we talk about babies all the time we go to weddings we plan showers we do all those things and and we stay in touch with with Julia with Modupe with Teresa with Jean with Debra and with Anna that was from another program so for me that's essential and I have also lots of other friends I see uh, the other Anna there somewhere so it, it's it's good to have that and, and to have the possibility of sharing that experience. Uh, and, and that sense of community and support was essential, not only in the academic and, and they have going through a journey that is different for everyone, but that is to some extent shared, but also in terms of the friendship and, and the, the being together in an environment that is not necessarily familiar eh, to all of us. So that is that was, for me, uh, a great, a part of the process and something that I value very much. Uh, the other thing, thing that I will highlight is also that you tend to, to see like the whole end of the process as like, this is the final point and this is where I'm going. And, and, and for me, it was a, a very like insightful and to some extent humbling because I was like, okay, I, I have, from the very beginning, I was like, I'm going to be here for five years, get my degree and go back to Colombia and continue doing what I was doing and retire there, right? And of course, uh, life proves you wrong. And uh, things happen. Uh, I am in a point in my life where I never thought that I was going to be. I moved back to the United States. I'm staying here. Life happens. And, and, and that brings you also the understanding that that is not the end goal. Uh, and you have to be flexible to, I, I don't want to see, to, to say that it's a new start or that it's like the starting point because, but it's a transition, right? And, and you don't know necessarily if that transition is going to take you into, to the same place, right? You may find a job or you may, got, may go back to your old job, but that is not necessarily 
uh, what you wanted to do anymore or you have to move or you want to do something else and and all those changes to some extent go back to that idea of adaptability that Jeremiah was mentioning before but to flexibility and also to know that that yes you got your degree and and you you completed that important step in the process right but but that does not necessarily mean that is, is the starting point of many new paths but you also need to acknowledge that that path is not necessarily what you thought at the beginning at the middle or that day when you were getting your diploma right and at some point it it may be completely different from what you expected so that's my two cents <laughs> um I'm actually gonna take my chair's prerogative and, and ask one more round of questions uh, of our panelists. Um, so through the degree process, there there are two periods of major transition. There's a transition from uh, basically being a student to being a candidate, which is the transition from uh, being in class to being on your own writing uh, a dissertation. So the transition from structured being a student to unstructured being a, a, a researcher. And then there's the transition when you graduate from uh, being a student to being an academic, uh, to being a professional scholar. Um, any thoughts on um, what helped you navigate those transitions things you wish you someone had told you when you were making those transitions etc um start with jp again uh sure um well i guess the the, the transition for me was sort of i at least for this year ended up knowing what I was going to do before I graduated. Um, but I also really did start applying for stuff like really late. Um, so I think one thing that's important to, to, to think about is to have a sense of when um, you will be finishing and then to gauge um, like the job market based off that. So if you anticipate with, um, of course, having discussed it with your committee that you will likely finish in the spring of the next year, then you should in the fall of the previous year be actively on the job market, right? Um, because otherwise, if, if you wait until you discover in the spring that you're going to finish, um, the only kinds of jobs that you'll be able to apply for then are um, visiting or postdocs uh, because the longer term tenure track stuff, they come out um, a year in advance. So that's one thing to think carefully about. And in light of that, it's something that you have to think carefully about because it takes a lot of planning. Um, going from my experience, um, so I'm in a visiting position this year, and I didn't really have plans of looking for, I mean, I was thinking of doing like maybe other visiting stuff and postdocs, and then decided, okay, I should probably broaden my possibilities which meant that I started applying for a variety of jobs. And that is when I discovered that, oh my God, this takes a whole lot of planning. Basically, um, the job market has taken the entire September, October, November of my time because you spend like maybe two months. I mean, I start applying late. You probably spend two to three months just doing job applications. And you may think that you reuse the material from one to the next, but each of them requires you to tailor stuff, right? Um, you're applying to IR jobs, but an IR job here requires different language than an IR job there. 
Um, and so if you're sending the standard letter, you may be missing some of the nuances of what they're looking for in the position and, and, and marketing yourself for that. It is also a very awkward thing to do to um, write about yourself, right? At least I find it um, to be um, odd to sing my own praises, but that is sort of what the job market requires you to do. Not just write about it, but then in interviews, you have to sing your own praises. And then if you get through those interviews and go somewhere else, you have to sing your own praises to like 20 people over a two-day period. Um, so... Yes, making the transition is something that you have to really prepare for because you're going to have to prepare for who are going to be who, who will be writing your letters. You have to give them due notice, um, right? We have um, a small group of faculty in the department, and we have lots of people now who have graduated or who are think or who are getting there, um, and so you will need to. Um, Give them due notice so that they can write good letters for you and they do write incredible letters um but also there are things to consider that you will have to do if you're applying for certain kinds of jobs tenure track jobs there are the screening interviews that you need to prepare for you do, right you need to know what are the kinds of things you're looking for um and then if you actually get to the next round of interviews it's a whole different ball game you have to do a thing called a job talk that i discovered maybe a week before having to do one <laughs> fortunately the department was kind enough to organize a practice for me which i think if ever you're thinking of going on the job market that is something that you should definitely do right um i'll probably stop there and i could probably ask questions i mean answer questions further, but give the others an opportunity to speak about it. Um, two things I, I think I'd flag there in what JP just said. First, yes, do a practice job talk before you do, do a real job talk. Uh, Department of Health, you organize it, it it's hugely useful. Uh, the second is that, uh, as JP noted, it doesn't seem in advance that being on the job market is going to take that much time. And it's not even that it takes that much time. It's the job market is like taking a huge vacuum cleaner and sticking it in your reserves of emotional energy and just sucking them out. I don't know what you do about that. It's just a thing. And on that happy note, Jeremiah. Yes. So uh, this is really good because we get to tell you guys the real, real, real deal, the real story. So I think I'll also share my experience, um, starting with uh, when I was still a student and up to this point, because it's been a bit of a, a journey. So in terms of applying for jobs, one thing JP said, which is very true, that you're going to realize it's these things take a lot of time. A lot of time. Writing, you need to, you need to brace yourself for writing. It's, it's basically... Yes, you're, you're not just going to write the letter alone. I think most of you already know this. You'll write letters, you have at least three, or usually at least two statements, <laughs> sometimes four. Yeah, so uh, it's that's before the job talk. And also, that does not guarantee you'll get an interview. So you might be writing like 10, 20, 30, and so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough one. But let me go back to uh, my, the beginning of, of, uh, of my journey. I think I started applying for jobs right around when I, when I knew I was going to finish. Yeah, after, after field work. And after I started writing and I knew that around this time I'll be done. So what JP said was spot on. And uh, that first round, it, I didn't get much. But then um, the following year, I applied and I didn't hear much. I had from two. Uh, one was an adjunct online. And then the other one was uh, a lecture position. And um, I got both. But the adjunct came earlier. I never got to do it because it was just training after training after training, onboarding, they call it onboarding. And then once you're done with onboarding, you were told you'll get a contract usually between 
six to I don't know one year's time if you've not taught by that time. So this is pool, you know, the pool kind of if you've not gotten anything by that time, you have to reapply again. And then I got the lecture job and I transitioned. And when I was there, the reason I want to go to when I was there at uh, the lecture position or the lecturer position, my department was hiring. And so they were hiring a, a tenure track position, which I didn't qualify for because of what they were requiring. And so I decided to attend the job talks. And by attending the job talks, I got to learn how uh, things go because I had never attended any job talk up to that point. And um, so when it got to my time to do my own job talk, I reached out to Prof. Stacy, and he was kind enough to, <laughs> to give me some tips. And um, yeah, so it helps, it helps, but it's, it's not an easy, it's not an easy thing. And uh, you just need to prepare yourself. Just know that it's work by itself. And if you're gonna do it while you're still writing, uh, maybe not very advisable. You should do it when you're almost done. Yeah, when you know you're, you're because it's gonna take a lot of your time. You may not actually finish your writing. <laughs> Yeah, so um, yes, I think that's that's all um, I have at this point. Thank you, Natalia. I the job market is a job, <laughs> pretty much, and and it takes a lot of time, and it's something that some that if if looking back you could say like maybe i if i can take a couple of months or a semester off to do this thing correctly that's like the ideal scenario right when you say like okay i'm gonna do nothing but applying to jobs for six months and but of course it's it, that is not something that that is ideal i for me the experience was a little bit difficult different because i i had a job right i was supposed to go back to colombia to to the job that I had and it was a and and it was part of a transition that proved to be a different job of course and 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 I knew that I was different and and I at some point I recognized that that students change a lot in five years so that was also a, a factor but a, in in that context of the transitions I think that they are both different right for me the transition to a student and to from a student to candidate was probably more challenging in in a certain way and and more into into getting to to defend my proposal was was the more cha the more challenging one uh, my best advice for that one is get the support of your cohort get the support of your committee and ask for help if you need it that that's something that that definitely creates like a, for me it was more like of a breaking point right and 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 that is important when when moving into the candidate to 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 the job and and going back to the case of course there, there are different circumstances my my experience also involved like going back home and and moving back after being here for six years and all sorts of things from that were challenging from the logistical, personal, professional point of view that, that are part of that. When I realized that I was going to move back and, and that I needed a job, I started the same process than, than Jeremiah and, and JP. I think that I applied to one job while I was still in Boston and I got a, a Skype or now like a Zoom back, back then was a Skype, I guess, <laughs> but a, 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 an online interview. And again, Stacey was kind enough to do a mock with me and, and to, to help me with that process and check my background and all of that to make sure that, that all those things were okay. But uh, after that, it, it's like, it's a process that you have to get into dynamic, but each job application is even, I have like my job applications notebook and I have records of all of that. I have done a couple of, of campus visits and, and all of that process gets you like, like a better sense of, of that. Uh, my best advice on that front is, is to be open as well and to be flexible and, and to, to try to, to, not to be disencouraged 
by many of that process because as as Sammy was saying at some point, uh, being part of this specific job market is going to be one of the most consuming, energy consuming experiences of your life. And as Jeremiah was saying as well, most of the time you're going to hear nothing like zero. You submit your four statements, your CV, your you ask for your letters of recommendation, all the faculty members help us with those. And you're like, it went into a void. Like, I don't know what happened with half of the applications. Like six months later, a tiny email saying that, thank you for your application and the, that they have hired somebody, right? But it's, it's, don't, don't let yourself get in this encouraged for that because like it or not, that's how it works, right? Of course, you have your up and downs. And I have had days where I was like, I just, uh, and and as I move on, I have also figured out that that I have other opportunities and be more open to the idea. The job that I have right now, I got it because I apply to a non-academic job at an academic institution. I was going to go into more of a consultant researching administrative work. And I didn't get that job because I, I didn't fulfill one of the requirements that somebody saw my CV for an opening for an adjunct. And, and that's how I ended up uh, working as a lecturer uh, as I am right now. So all of those things are, are opportunities, right? And, and be open to consider uh, all of those as practice as learning as i i don't like the networking word but you can connect and see other people and learn from those processes and and see the opportunity that is better for you is is going to find you at some point and and i know that it's challenging it's especially challenging like for example when as in my case where i have very limited geographical limitations where i can find a job but uh, all of those things are, are factors and, and are part of the process. Thank you. Um, so I have a few questions in chat that I want to address. Um, one I'm going to talk about briefly myself and then uh, toss a couple more to the um, panel. Uh, one question is, can we get a short description of a job talk? Um, the short description is it's a presentation of your dissertation research that should la usually should last 30 to 35 minutes. Uh, the place you're giving the talk to will give you parameters, follow their parameters, subset of the broader, always read the instructions advice. Um, and job trucks are tricky because you at the same time are trying to convince the specialists in your field that uh you have deep knowledge of the stuff and you have new uh knowledge to bring to the department and at the same time you're trying to convince the people who aren't specialists in your fields that you have something interesting to say that is uh accessible to them um the other thing i will say about uh job talks is that uh the conflict resolution human security and global governance department is in the process of a job search on the conflict resolution end of things, but we hope to be doing job interviews uh, in uh, probably January. Stacy, probably January. Yeah, January and first half of February, somewhere in there. Yeah. Um, so there will be a set of uh, job talks, and we will be ideally hiring one of the people who gives one of them. Um, so, uh, if you're around, come to those, um, and judge for yourself. Uh, usually you'll be able to develop your own feel for what was a good talk and what was not a good talk. And, and you can sort of, uh, replicate that, uh, two of the questions that I'm going to read and then, uh, open them both at the same time. Um, one, was there a point in your PhD journey when, oh, someone asked a new question and then I lost where I was reading. Was there a point in your PhD journey when you thought you had taken on more than um, more than you could chew? If you did, how did you get through that moment? Um, 
And was there a point in the program where you felt your passions changed or you wanted to redirect what you were writing about? Uh, feel free to talk about both or either or neither, if you like. Um, start with Natalia this time around. I'll start with the second one. And uh, you all know that I wrote on my third dissertation topic, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that happens <laughs> in different ways. And, and honest to God, there's no problem with that. I, I, uh, I apply with a proposal on biodiversity politics. When the PhD started, I was going to write on the Sustainable Development Goals. And after I did that first presentation in the Colloquium Summit, if you remember correctly, that was a huge fiasco. So I went back to work on, on the stuff that I was doing as, as a research assistant for, for the Center on uh, the Implementation on Environmental Agreements. And that's how I, what I did uh, for, for my dissertation. So. Uh, I, I, I defend, uh, I'm, I'm an advocate of the right to change your dissertation topic at some point, if, if that's the case. And, and it, ha it has been, it, it can happen for multiple reasons. It can be a factor of your passions and your interests and what you discover through your process. It can be a factor of the topic. One of the issues that motivated me to change the SDG topic, which I was probably the most passionate about of the three of them to some extent is that uh, I was afraid of writing at the same time that the policy process was going on because I did that for my master's degree and I spent nights awake worried about, I wrote my, my master's dissertation about the foreign policy between Colombia and Venezuela and I spent nights awake convinced that I was going to woke up and they have agreed to restore the, the relations and my dissertation was going to be a, a killed in the process because I had nothing relevant to write about anymore, right? So uh, I think that that, that is certainly a, a possibility. On the, the taking to mash, it's, it's a back and forth. There's days where you are like, what in the name of God did I decide to do this? Uh, and and you're going to to have challenges and to have and you want to go home and to uh, spend the day in bed and do nothing and there are other days where you are like I need to finish this and at, I I think that that is probably the most important moment of those all and th there's gonna be a point where you're like this is it I I'm going to finish and from here from here on is onward and that's it. And and that that breaking point when you're writing and when you start submitting chapters or you start working on on your final draft and revising things and all of that, uh, uh, that's good and 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 it's important to set to set deadlines to yourself and and to go on that process because it's it's uh, at least it's, it's a huge uh, driver to a certain point and and a sense of accomplishment always helps. So I think that, that in that way is important, but don't, don't be worried about having those moments of, of taking too much. And, and it is important to, to reassess and, and to know exactly what is it that you can do without a, having to sacrifice like other things that are also important and that, that, that allows us to keep a balance a, in our day-to-day -day lives. Thank you. Jeremiah, sorry to keep putting you in the middle, but it, it just sort of works. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> yeah, so um, on the issue of uh, topics changing and or interests changing, I think uh, from my experience and from the advice that I got uh, from uh, faculty, including Prof. Sami and everyone else who was there when I was there, it's a normal thing. So I think that... Um, Maybe it shouldn't change too late, but uh, yeah, but I think in early stages, I think it's a normal thing. Because I remember in my year one, um, what I came in to do changed into something else. And then uh, eventually something in the middle is what I ended up doing. So, so it's kind of, uh, it changes. Because when you get into the program, you're exposed to a lot of 
literature and by the time you're applying you probably haven't read that much then you realize some of the questions you want to ask are already answered or so do you want to ask them differently or do you want to go a different direction so it's possible yeah it's possible to change i don't think that should worry you so much maybe you should get a little bit worried if it's changing too late because that might be yeah you might end up doing another <laughs> maybe taking 10 years or, or something uh, yeah so that might be yeah but i think year one yeah year two probably not that bad and on uh what what was the other one I mean, was it on if you feel low or something like that what was the second question i don't know was there any point in your career where you felt you bit off more than you could chew and and what did you do about it oh yeah that, that was there yeah but <laughs> maybe not a bit more than you could chew but feeling like oh am i going to finish this so one of the things i learned i struggled with um, i don't know whether you guys feel this but uh, what do we call it imposter syndrome yeah so but at some point you realize that almost everyone has it if you're lucky you realize that and it helps you but if you don't realize it can really beat you down and so i was in two cohorts i was in um gghs and uh i get and those were more like two different <laughs> So your head keeps going, they're supposed to complement, but most of the time it was more like additional work and sometimes pulling you to two different directions, kind of. Um, so you have a lot of, there's a, there's a stage where it was, yeah, I, I went to Sammy's office and <laughs> so you need, to, you need to go seek out help. It helps you understand that it's normal. And yeah, so yeah. I think I think all these things are it happens to all of us. Yeah. Thank you. Uh thanks. Uh Eigert, by the way, is the interdisciplinary graduate education research and training or something like that, which is a program uh the National Science Foundation was running for several years to support interdisciplinary doctoral education, but unfortunately they've stopped funding it. Um but at least Jeremiah got some money from them while while we could. Uh, JP? Uh, sure. Um, so I'll start with the second question, which was about if your passions changed. So fortunately, you had the example of Jeremiah and Natalia because I was different. Um, I came in thinking that I wanted to do stuff on securitization of migration, and I stuck to it. Um, maybe the focus um, evolved as I began to read the literature and so on. But I think the fact that I didn't change allowed me to do some things. Like I remember in Sam's theories class, we had an assignment that was supposed to do sort of a survey of the literature. I made that about migration and security, right? So I was able to use the assignments from the different courses I was doing, um, including the methods courses, right? To develop my um, project proposal. Um, so if you have a clear sense of where you're going, that's an avenue to explore. But to also say that I have colleagues um, who change their topics multiple times as well, and quite possibly in the third year, and we finished at the same time. So don't panic. Um, to answer the first question, I think you're almost certain to bite off more than you can chew because you um we start off thinking that we're going to change the world on a grand scale and so you are likely to to propose a research project that is way more than you can actually do and you will eventually discover this right maybe when you get into the field and you realize that okay you can inv um interview 200 people that didn't happen to me <laughs> But I did at some point discover that, I mean, like part of what I proposed could have been an entire dissertation. Um, and for quite a bit, I, 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 mean, I was really complex about this. Like, you know, I felt like I wasn't going to finish because this, I had all the other bits going, but there was just this one little piece that was a whole lot of data to analyze, but just for one, like all that analysis was probably going to be um three paragraphs in a subsection right but it was so much and i had proposed to do so much and i realized that 
I'm planning to do the work that could be a dissertation just so I could write three paragraphs. And so I consulted with my committee. And wow, what a difference that consultation made. The moment they were like, you know, you don't actually have to do that bit was the moment I finished my dissertation. It was like, that was what I was waiting for. Um, so yes, the, I guess the short answer to it is, if you realize that you bite, you've bitten off a bit more than you can chew, there are people there who can advise you, right? Again, don't panic. Um, don't panic is actually good general advice. Um, um, Follow-up question to the question about what do job talks look like uh, that I'm actually going to send off to the panel rather than answer myself is um, how much have you uh, had to change how you frame your work depending on the department you may be applying to at the time? Was it easy to feel like you had a consistent sense of identity in your work or did it shift for each, to, for each application? And whoever wants to jump in first, feel free to do so. Okay, no one did. So well, I, I could go, given that I'm, I'm just doing it right now. Um, I think you are definitely not going to be presenting your dissertation defense, right? So you're presenting your dissertation work, but it's not the it's not that presentation that you prepared for your defense. Um, it is a different kind of presentation in that yet you are marketing your research in a sense while so so it's less about defending your work and more so presenting it as if you are now the authority on this presenting it to a room of scholars because you are showing that you now belong to the community so you have to frame it in that way um and also have to be cognizant of the fact that though you are you're expected to demonstrate that you are scholarly enough but that you can also communicate to an audience that is a mix of scholars, students, people from other disciplinary backgrounds. Um, so it takes quite a bit of preparation. I probably should have prepared way more, but again, right? I at least I had I had I had I had good help to to get it to a point where it worked well in the end. Um, so I would say that that is something that you need. One, the moment you think that you're going to be hitting the the job market, that is something that you start working on and fine tuning it, practicing it. Um, you may end up going and realizing that you prepared a script and you can't use it um, because you don't have a lectern. That was always the case. I did not have a lectern at all. Well, I did have in I think the last one that I did. Um, so prepare for that make sure it's something that you know you can you can defend it and i used the same i used the same um job talk for the the different um ones that i was doing so i found that if you tailor your research from the beginning um right you then um you can you can make it work because bits of what the, the story that i chose to tell okay was the other thing i would say it's so you're sort of telling a story about your research and it's not your whole dissertation research. So the part of it that I chose and the story I chose to tell about my research covered the variety of um, jobs that I was applying to. And then you can always flag things that you don't go into details about that allows them to ask you about the other parts that you didn't raise. And I found that that worked um, really well. So I didn't necessarily have to change um, my identity to fit them. But if you were applying for vastly different um, programs, then certainly you may have to have a different talk, right? If you're applying to a, to an interdisciplinary department and they and and they have something like really niche, um, maybe you have to tailor your job talk to that. But I was applying to sort of similar things. Okay, I, yeah, my, yes, I can I can take it. I think uh, I think it depends on. Um, the job that's advertised yeah because uh, from my experience every job requires something so if if like jp says if you're looking for jobs that are looking for that same thing which is out there of course there are several jobs looking for almost the same thing at different departments then you'll just stay with the same 
almost same material. But if you're looking for, so for example, like I'm more interdisciplinary and uh, sometimes I apply to departments that are not very traditional. So I have to tailor my applications. Yeah, so, so there's a bit of tailoring, but I don't think it really changes who you are because at the end of the day, you're still the interdisciplinary scholar that you are. You're not gonna apply for, for example, something that's way out of your area of specialty or area of interest. So there's a bit of tweaking, but I wouldn't say it changes your identity per se. Yeah, I, I haven't felt like it changes your identity. <laughs> yeah, thank you. If I can add to that, I think that there are two things that, that are important as part of that job talk process. One, I think that on the contrary, it sort of gives you the chance of of fitting into your identity the most and showing specifically how is it that that this work that you're doing is relevant and how it connects to that department that you're applying to, either if it is interdisciplinary or if it has that special approach connected to your topic. The other way in which it is important is that, as Sami was saying before, there are very specific instructions, right? And when you have your dissertation present, presentation is mostly for your committee and some experts that are in the audience and a couple of friends that uh, are there or people that have no idea. My, I remember at my dissertation presentation, my now husband came back, came to me at the end and said, like, now I understand what, what is it that you do your research on. So it's, it's also for, for the uninformed audience that at some point is not that familiar with that. When you go to the job talk, you have those experts and, and those people from the, that people from the department that are, are, are working on that but also you may have a student, right? So it's also a way, it, in some cases, when you do a campus visit, you have like the class for the students and the job talk. But in most cases, those are mixed, right? So they bring the, the people from the department, but also a class of students to, to, that are there to learn about the topic, not to learn about how to do a job talk. So uh, that is, that is, uh, or how not to do a job talk, but that is important uh, in in the process to tailor also to show and to make as part of your presentation how you will teach those topics and, and how you will reach to that audience. Uh, sorry, Sammy, if I could just, I just wanted to pick up on something that Natalia said, which was that sometimes you will also be required to do a teaching demonstration, which is what she was referencing. So sometimes you will actually have to prepare a lesson, maybe shorter than what you, you would normally teach, but you'd have to prepare a lesson and actually deliver that to um, a group of students on odd occasions. Well, I, I know people who have done it to faculty, do, done the teaching demo in front of faculty, but that was probably during COVID when, when students weren't around. But she also, as she also said, sometimes where they don't have an explicit teaching demonstration they use the job talk as well to do both things and so you have to be cognizant of that that they are not only listening to your ability to communicate your research but they're also using that as a way of judging how you teach thank you um our glorious leader has suggested a question. So rather than have me read it, I'm going to suggest that he turn his camera on and, and ask himself. All right. Um, uh, my buttons weren't working. Um, uh, I wanted- It happens uh, to me all the time. <laughs> to express, press, press. Um, uh, um, I wanted to uh, ask you to talk a little bit about the process of learning about how to publish um, and, you know, kind of positive uh, parts of that experience, accomplishments, you know, a little story, but also the sort of, you know, hard knocks, the, 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 the harder lessons, just give us a little sense of, of whether it starts in graduate school for you and then goes after, or, you know, just talk a little bit about learning the uh the 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 slings and arrows of uh publishing it's 
but yeah. I can say that one. Okay. Let's start with Natalia. Uh, it's a it's a learning process, and and I guess we can start by saying that we're always still learning. Uh, it's it it to some extent goes back to to grad school, and and it's important to start getting your feet wet there at some point in that process uh, because uh, as as you move out of of the program, you're going to have to balance all of that and and your pipeline of of publications with the job market and and all of those things are are challenging so if if you can start working on that at some point during grad school is helpful uh, the most important lesson beyond the logistics is also to understand that sometimes you will have to tweak things to make them uh, more publishable if that's a word and a uh, you also continue learning about your process and 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 your methodology and your work. Uh, when I publish my my methodology uh, and the structure of the index uh, as an article, I had very intense discussions with very stubborn reviewers uh, that that were were very specific about the the structure that they wanted to see, and it was it was. Uh, and I have had lots of, of discussions also in the policy world. Uh, that is probably my other relevant audience and, and Anna that is there have, have witnessed those to some extent. But it is important uh, to also know that, that there are things that you can continue adjusting, right? And, and that uh, not because uh, your dissertation is final and sign and seal and deliver, it means that that you have a like that you cannot continue figuring out a other approaches to your data and to your analysis that may work for publication but that can also be helpful to refine a, some of those things and and the the use that that your data can have a, both at in the a scholars world but also in some cases a, in the policy world so i i think that that those have have a, been important lessons for me beyond like the logistics a, these things take time a, a, it's it's challenging in terms of waiting to hear about the process in doing reviews in a, working a, with the reviewers and finalizing your drafts but but it's a, it's also a, a learning experience a, that you continue to develop those skills and, and you also sort of develop the thick skin that is needed a, to, to move on with those processes. Um, uh, I, I will just frag, flag the phrase thick skin. You need this for the publishing process. JP? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think maybe I will use this as an opportunity to go back to that second year, what you should know question. Um, what I thought I should have known then is that academia, apparently at every stage, is replete with these anxiety inducing processes. <laughs> it does, it doesn't start when you get um, to Canada. It doesn't start when you get in, in, in the field and it certainly doesn't stop when you have graduated, right? It probably is just starting. <laughs> um, and so I think publication is one of those anxiety inducing processes. Um, and I think I would suggest that the earlier you attempt it, the better it is for you, right? Um, I tried publishing um, for the first time when I had finished my master's and I was teaching back in Jamaica. And that was because one of my mentors suggested that, you know, give it a shot. Um, you wrote some um, good papers during um, the program. Um, maybe work with one of your professors to refine one of those and, you know, aim for maybe not a top tier journal, but you know, an accessible journal just to get your feet wet in the process. Um, I tried that with a couple papers um, and it worked with one of them, right? I mean, I did get the feedback on the ones that it didn't work. Um, they were harsh, but true. Um, 
but I got really good feedback um, on on the one that eventually got picked up. That said, um, you are also writing papers during your program, right, for the different courses that you're doing. And knowing the kind of work that you're putting into it and also the kind of feedback that you're getting, you can test some of these papers as well, right? Maybe test them at a conference first. Um, one of the papers that I published, I did it for Peggy's class. I see that Peggy's online. Um, so Peggy was teaching IO um, global governance, uh, right? And so I did a paper in her class and she encouraged me to do um, to, to present it at ISA Northeastern, which by the way, you should. Um, and she and Jeff really helped me um, work on that um, paper. To, to take to the conference and after they gave me really good feedback and I got really good feedback at ISA Northeastern. And, and I eventually had that paper published. Um, the same for another paper from another course, right? This was a, a, what I submitted for an assignment, right? When I got into the field, I was able to, to add more data to the paper, but the frame of the paper was the same that I submitted in, in, in one of my classes. But I suppose the other lesson that I learned so um, hopefully Peggy won't mind my sharing this. We worked on a project together with Peggy and um, Kirsten Hack. And it was an amazing experience for me because I realized that it's not just because I am a PhD candidate still trying to figure out research, why I may not get favorable feedback from um, reviewers and from journals because our paper, um, Peggy, was we got um, at least a couple of desk rejects, right? Um, before we were able to refine that paper and it was published in Global Governance. Um, and I think Stacy has shared similar stories of right, his papers being rejected. So it's, it tells you that it's not about you. Um, so give it a shot. Jeremiah, do you have anything to add? Yes, I think that's a good way to pick it up. Uh, I think uh, it's good to get used to, even before I talk about writing, it's good to get used to this um, understanding that academia is, is more like uh, rejection veil. So it's, it's where, <laughs> it's where you, you get a lot of rejection. Yeah, and um, one thing that I've seen that's different for me now that I'm on tenure track is that the writing is, there's a time limit so the anxiety gets ramped up to like 10 times or sometimes. So it's different from when you're just writing. Um, yeah, because the clock is ticking. And then um, for some of us, COVID has not made it very easy. So on top of rejections, there's the delay in the review process, finding reviewers. So a, a paper that should take you maybe six months or thereabout will take you a year or something. So, <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's, but I think you get used to it with time. And um, I'll just say, you just keep at it and know that writing is a learning process and it's different for every stage. So like my stage, it's, it's a completely different from how I was writing when I was in the lecturer position. At that point, I could do all manner of stuff. At this stage, there are sections of my dissertations that I cannot write about because they're not relevant to my tenure requirements. So you have just to let them, even if you like them, you have to let them be. Because if you write about them, you're just wasting your time. <laughs> the clock is ticking. Yeah, so it's very specific to different stages. But like I said, get used to the fact that we're in rejectionville. And as long as you want to stay here, that would be uh, the order of the day. Yeah, but it's a learning process. I agree with all of them. I agree with uh, Natalia as well. It's, it's a learning process. I'm still um, learning it. Yeah, I started like, um, like JP, I started writing when I was just after I finished my master's. So my first publication was um, my master's, based on my master's thesis. And I'm still learning, it's still, <laughs> And like you see, it said Prof. Can uh, uh, or Prof. Peggy also gets rejections. Prof. Stacy gets rejection. Everybody gets rejection. Yeah. So it's <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. 
Um, so I notice we're just about out of time here. Um, do any of the three of you have any parting, any last parting words of wisdom that you'd like to close with? No pressure, really. Keep going. <laughs> Keep going. The struggle is real, but it's worth it. Uh, there's life outside the PhD and after the PhD. <laughs> And there's light at the end of the tunnel, they say. I, 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 I have been, I, I give advice like a grandmother with very specific <laughs> sentences. Or, so uh, keep going. The struggle is real. There's life at the end of the tunnel. And there's life after the PhD. And, and be open, right? It's, it's it, as I was saying before, I, I was very convinced that when I started the PhD and pretty much all the way until my last year, I was very convinced that I was going to go back to Colombia and have my job and continue doing what I was doing before in a different way. And uh, that's, that uh, life proved me wrong in so many different ways. So all of those uh, changes require flexibility, requires adaptability, and requires, I know that it sounds uh, cheesy or tacky, but you have to go with the flow and, and see where life takes you and takes your take your opportunities from there. And as much as we all love uh, being in academia, we also know that, that there are other opportunities there and, and also be aware that that does that maybe it can be the case that academia is not for you, right? And and that is a, a realization that is also important, and and that's not that does not necessarily mean that the PhD was less important or less worth it because you you go into other uh, paths. Uh, I have been exploring uh, a life outside academia a little bit for the past year or so in terms of those opportunities. And, and the truth is that there are many skills that come from the PhD that are also very relevant in, in the outside world, let's say. So all of those things are, are important and, and, and there's also opportunities in that front as well, because uh, yes, it's, it's, it's what it is and, and we need, what is more important is what, that we find the places in the world where, where we can uh, also uh, in a grandmother fashion, uh, develop our potential and continue growing and, and, and be the, the persons that we want to be, continuing our interests and, and our intellectual skills and, and research and passions uh, from different perspectives. Thanks, uh, Jeremiah or JP? Jeremiah. Uh, three quick ones that um, I, I think I should, they're general stuff, but I think um, at least one of them I should say. So maybe I'll say two quickly and then I'll go with the last one that I feel is important. So um, when those interested in academic jobs, I think you should be, depending on your own situation, you should be willing to look outside the United States if that's something you want to consider. And then, um, the other thing I want to say is uh, seek out actively seek out mentorship um, and uh, and guidance. Yeah, I I keep bugging some of the guys in this uh, Zoom call. <laughs> they know themselves, so just you just keep seeking out mentorship and guidance. And the last one, which I think is connected to what both JP and um, and Natalia said, is about networking. And this is something I want to share because it connects with our it concerns our program ggHS uh, we need to network within our growing alumni one example I want to give you is there's a time I wanted to apply for a job and I won't say what period but somebody was in that department a former and one of us and then I reached out to them and told them oh there's this nice job in your department I want to give it a shot what do you think and so we organized and had a call and it turned out that was a fake jobber. There was already a candidate that's going to be taken. And so if I didn't reach out, I would have wasted like a whole week writing one job ad. 
for nothing. So if you can reach out to people in um, wherever they are, those in the academia, before you apply for positions in their departments, they can help you and save you a lot of time sometimes. Yes, that's all. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, sure, I guess two really quick things. Um, one is the fact that, well, I suppose it, it ties in with what Jeremiah says that you should be open to thinking outside the US, but even if you're thinking here, um, is that the academic job market is such that the job that you may be applying for that you end up getting could be in a small town in Indiana, in Wisconsin or Washington. And you will end up with a window of a week or two weeks to take a decision that is going to determine what happens with at least seven years of your life. So um, prepare yourself for that, not to scare you. And then the other thing I want to come back to is community. And it's tied to this point as well, because when you have to make those decisions, the network that you've created, the friends that you have, along with family and the faculty, honestly, I cannot say this enough. You are, if you are currently in the department or if you're thinking about joining the department, you will be in one of the best places that you can be because the faculty are, they go above and beyond. Um, maybe if you ask Jeff, Peggy and Stacy right now to hold up their, um, their, their um, call log, um, you will see how many times my name appears in their call logs over the past um, three months, right? Um, so they've been incredibly supportive. And, and that's the kind of support that you have from the faculty in, in, in the department. I'm sure that um, Sammy is doing likewise for um, his advisees, among others, right? So um, that is important. Community is important. Make sure you build those connections with your professors and with your colleagues as well, because you're gonna to need to lean on them a whole lot at some point in time. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Jean-Pierre. Thank you, Jeremiah. Thank you, Natalia. Thanks as always to Kelly for organizing because none of this stuff would happen if Kelly didn't make it happen. Uh, thank you everyone else for coming and talking with us. Um, and that's about it. Good night all.